Please welcome Disease Diagnostic Group, presenting is John Lewandowski. Right, take it away, John. What if I told you I could save one million lives every year with just refrigerator magnets and a laser pointer? My name is John Lewandowski. My company is Disease Diagnostic Group, and we are reinventing malaria diagnostics. We've all heard that annoying sound before. Campsites, picnics, maybe even vacations. But what if you heard that sound every night of your life? And it wasn't just one, it was hundreds. What if I also told you that that sound came from the deadliest creature on the planet? Suddenly, it'd be a little less annoying and a little more scary. Malaria infects 500 million people around the world every single year. That's one out of every 12 people on this planet. Over 100 different countries are endemic and are forced to deal with malaria on a daily basis. And for all the press that Ebola has gotten recently, one Ebola case is matched with over 100 malaria deaths and 50,000 malaria infections, to put things into perspective. So meet Emmanuel. Emmanuel is six years old, lives in Tanzania, in about a village population of 1,000. He's likely to contract malaria three to four times every year. Now, last night, he was bit by a mosquito and isn't really sure if he has malaria or not. So what are his options? Well, his parents forced him to go for the gold standard, to walk two miles to the nearest clinic and get his blood read through a microscope by a clinician. When he gets there, they take about one hour to prepare the sample, and it costs all of his family's majority earnings for that day. But most importantly, can you spot the infection on this slide? Well. Neither could the clinician. There was actually a low-level infection, and this tiny parasite can grow, multiply, and invade other cells, and ultimately continue that transmission cycle. And that's why malaria is a $12 billion problem today. It's because someone like Emmanuel got misdiagnosed, didn't get treated, and went back to his village and spread it to his entire friends and family. But our solution is the RAM. So let's meet the rapid assessment of malaria. It's a reusable device that matches refrigerator magnets and a laser pointer with a consumable plastic cuvette and a patient database. He's very inexpensive because you can reuse him over and over and over again. But he's also fast. In fact, he's so fast that in one day, he could diagnose everybody in this room twice. If this were a clinic, the microscopist wouldn't get past the first row. Everybody else, he should have got here earlier. So let's walk through how this would work. So Manuel would come into the clinic, maybe even his own, and he would turn the device on. The uh, clinician would take a finger pick of blood. And place it in the cuvette. and then shake it up. Now even Emmanuel could do this because it doesn't require any clinical expertise. He simply places it in the device, and as soon as the device is calibrated, he can press go. Now while that's calibrating, we can go back to the presentation briefly and look at what's actually happening inside the test. So we're looking at magnetic biomarkers within these malaria parasites. What this allows us to do is manipulate these magnets in a way that change the amount of light that comes through the sample. That gives us not only a binary decision on yes or no if he has an infection, but also how large that is. Uh, and it looks a lot like this. So if you have an infection, the tiny microorganisms in the sample will be doing this underneath that magnetic field and be giving us a quantitative diagnosis for that blood sample. We'll now start running the test, and we'll come back in about 20 seconds to see the result. What this ultimately gives us is a patient database with a patient ID and a score. That score is qualitative or quantitative to how large that infection is and actually gives you the amount of treatment that you need to give to him. It also stores that patient ID number so you can then track his uh, diagnoses over time, even do an epidemiology study for the WHO. So this device was built out of my research at MIT in mechanical engineering. We've built about 20 of these different devices over the lifetime of this company 
And what it's been able us to do is deploy them into Peru, Papua New Guinea, and India for clinical trials across about 1,000 patients and 95% sensitivity. So imagine the capabilities of this device. Imagine leaving this conference and going through airport security and getting your blood tests on the way out so that you don't transmit the infection into your incoming country. Imagine being able to take this device and put it on the back of a truck with mosquito bed nets or other treatment that's not normally allowed because of refrigeration issues. That's now possible. But let's make one thing very clear. This is not just the only device or the only test that we can do. It's just the first. Malaria is the first out of HIV, other neglected tropical diseases that we can attack with this magneto optical platform. We plan to do so in the coming years. And with that, I have two very big announcements. One, that we've par partnered with Bosch Healthcare in India for distribution. And also, we've gotten free product development services from the famous design firm IDEO to make the device smaller and improve the user interface. And so now we have uh, interest from a number of different organizations around the world, NGOs, malaria clinics, and even militaries. And so ultimately, my call to action is that if you know someone with malaria, know someone with high net worth that's interested in philanthropic investors, uh, visit our website and help us reach 1 billion people and stamp out malaria. Thank you. Awesome. Judges. Well, that was a great presentation. Thank you. There's, there's a guy called Bill Gates who's quite interested in solving malaria. <laughs> um, where is he with alternatives or with your solution? Or? So uh, the Bill Gates Foundation, Bill, Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is very uh, uh, well known and knows of this product. Uh, they've actually funded previous research into the biomarker that we're using and are looking for these clinical trials in these upcoming studies to validate if they want to invest more into diagnostics. They've been mainly focused recently on treatment and preventative measures because diagnostics in the past haven't been in a situation to succeed with their dollars that they've been put into it. So they're very interested in seeing these upcoming clinical studies. Well, what, right. So I didn't get what was the cost of the machine going to be? Oh, the cost of the machine? Uh, right now it's about $300. We're looking to scale that down to less than $50 uh, per use. To give you an estimate of the competitor's cost, those cost between 50 cents and a dollar, up to, to even $10. So you'd make your money back very quickly, knowing that an RFP is usually around 1 million tests, and they're bought in bundles. So um, I, I actually was brought up in, in Kenya and India, and, and my, um, my father caught malaria. And actually a good friend of mine, or a good friend of the family, we should say more, actually died of malaria, misdiagnosis, like you say. So I mean, I think you're dealing with a, a massive problem. It's a bit like us wanting to take on you know, polio, which they did in the day in terms of trying to eradicate it. And I just, you know, I just remember myself living with eating malaria pills and, you know, having those trucks driving around getting DDT. So, I mean, it's really expensive process in terms of managing disease. But I think that for me, what I thought that, you know, what, what really needs to happen if you're going to have a product like this, you're going to need sort of a move. First of all, the price needs to go down dramatically, but you also need to make it sort of a movement almost. You, also, you need to get, because there's so many big entities that need to be involved to really eradicate a disease like this. How do you make that happen? How do you make it more? Because I actually think your branding of your, of your name and the product doesn't really work well with that kind of notion. Sure. I appreciate the, the feedback. And what I can say is the partners that we've developed so far, in individuals like Doctors Without Borders, Bosch, those allow us to tap into pre-existing distribution channels that necessarily maybe other devices or previous diagnostics haven't been able to do. So they've been trying to attack the market either one at a time or without that major partner behind them. So they've either fallen uh, susceptible to corruption or external costs due to distributors or other agents taken into the country. Uh, and I agree. So this device right now costs about $50 for the test. And then each individual uh, unit costs about one or two cents. And so we're able to make a significant profit both on the device and also provide it for a uh, smaller cost than the other alternatives because of this reusable model. And so that's something that hasn't been implemented before and now allows us to go through some of these other distribution channels that have widespread uh, markets like Coca-Cola, like mosquito bed nets, and that's never been attempted before. Right. Okay, cool. So, so where does this fall down in terms of usability? It's a very commendable goal. I also grew up in India and you know we've all lived with this. But if you think about what you need to test to see if this is viable really in a mass production, and in mass deployment in very sort of unsanitary conditions and villages, et cetera, where would this fall down? What are the three things the product has to do in order for you to know that it's going to work and that you haven't tested yet? I would say one is the ability to uh, eliminate user error from the sample. So right now, as you saw me, I was taking a blood sample myself, inserting into the device, or in the cuvette, and then back into the device. That will all get streamlined through this IDEO product development where it's more, much more capillary action, something like you'd see in a blood glucose monitor. 
The second is robustness of the actual device. You can imagine there's a lot of strings you can pull with this device. You can either make it more sensitive, you can make it faster, you can make it more accurate, you can make it uh, lower cost. It's a potential to one, either make a number of different units that have e e different v features, or, like you said, just focus on robustness so that when you put it out there, it doesn't need to come back. And I would say third is the ability to get it into the right hands. And so uh, I mentioned that our ultimate goal is to get it to people who don't have any clinical training whatsoever. But another failure of diagnostics is not being able to get those people trained properly. So if we can make it as simple as possible to use with the help of the WHO with those clinical trials, we'll be able to scale this up unlike other diagnostics have before. How many units have you made so far? We've made about 20 units. Uh, and like I said, each one had a bomb of about $300. Have you, feel, have you field tested those? Yes. Yeah, so, so those are all fully field tested in Peru, Papua New Guinea, and India. And each of those was about 200 to 300 tests. Uh, and those are being published in a journal, uh, Clinical Chemistry. Hmm. Do, do you have any data on uh, false negatives? I know we, we talked a bit about this backstage yesterday, because my concern with this would be uh, using the, the technique with the, the lasers and the magnets, uh, is there a concern that maybe someone has been recently infected, the, uh, the, the load of the disease isn't high enough to detect it using this mechanism? So is there like a certain threshold it has to reach, or is it pretty, is it very soon after infection that it's able to, to reliably detect it? Sure. Uh, two points to that. So the first is that uh, this device can find someone very early in their incubation period, before they're symptomatic, because it can get down to just over one parasite per microliter, meaning if a blood drop of blood is 25 to 50 microliters, you only need to, need to have 25 to 50 parasitized cells in that sample to be able to detect it. That's very early. The other competition is usually 200 to 5,000 much later in that cycle, and so they're very much more prone to those false negatives. In addition, you'll notice that on the uh, trade-off is false positives. So it's also important to note that the treatment is about five times more expensive than uh, the diagnostic. So it's also important to balance both of those. Something that our device does because of the biomarker. It both rids itself quickly when someone's treated and develops early in that cycle. So how do you navigate the whole regulatory systems and so on to sort of get, get this out there, get it through? What, what do you need to do? So there's two main regulatory strategies, well, three main regulatory strategies. The first is what we've already started doing with private partners uh, and commercial partners. They have no regulatory authority uh, inherently and go towards their own government. So someone like Bosch India will convince their own government in India with their data that they're ready to sell this in their country. The second reg uh, regulatory stream is the WHO product approval. That allows you to go through such channels as uh, the public market in all of Africa. Those are annual bid tenders done on a, on a yearly basis with no switching costs. So that's where the majority of the, of the um, sales and revenue would come from. And in order to reach that, you need to have 75% sensitivity at a certain threshold and a certain number of false positives, all of which we've already uh, kind of managed in our clinical trials and shown. Just, just so I understand, you can sell this anywhere right now. Is that what you're saying? Well, we haven't gotten actually the, the WHO product approval yet. Most of these clinical trials were preliminary to get the people that we were doing them with interested, and then actually investing much larger into a full clinical study across uh, all of the different gold standards and make it regulatory uh, approved. How long does that take? Uh, we should be ready to hit the market for the private market with Bosch uh, as early as mid next year, and hopefully the public market uh, late next year. Sorry, I missed, is, is there IP that you can protect on this? Yeah. yeah, so this is a very well protected uh, IP space because we're matching a electromagnetic spectrum and at the center of that passing a uh, magnetic field through it. So now you have this perpendicular system with an analyte in the middle. You're looking for any uh, oscillation in that electromagnetic spectrum or a laser that correlates to that magnetic field manipulation. If that's the case, then you have some sort of analyte there that's magnetic. And in this case, it's specific and sensitive to malaria. On that point, we also have uh, IP being generated for the ability to scale up to other diseases, even if they don't have that inherent magnetic biomarker present. You could put magnetic beads into the sample and then look for that same uh, oscillation in, in, uh, at that frequency, and then you'll be able to know I either have malaria in this, this well, tuberculosis in this well, or very many others. So can you talk a little bit about your background and why you started this business and who else is in the team? And I have a second question as to why has this not been done before? Big problem, a lot of dollars, a lot of great minds. If you're familiar with the uh, research atmosphere right now, there's a lot of movement towards translational and interdisciplinary research. So this is 
was originally founded at Case Western Reserve University and now MIT, and it was a collaboration between mechanical engineers, physicists, clinicians, something that hadn't been done before for global health. And so overall, we're trying to eliminate those chemical tests from the market because they are outdated and traditional, and replace them with mechanical tests that haven't necessarily been attacked before. So that's where I come in. I'm a mechanical engineer. My goal is to build low-cost diagnostics that implement these mechanical properties of the cell or of the system, and then match that with clinical expertise from various advisors. So from that, we've also built up a very large advisory board and team. So we have a number of individuals who are philanthropic uh, potential investors, including uh, Kevin Plank, uh, uh, the CEO of Under Armour. We have a number of people who have taken similar products to the market in Africa before, like Bill Rodriguez of Dactari doing a similar reusable test for HIV and CD4 counters. We have individuals back in Cleveland and Boston who are both uh, malaria diagnostic specialists on our advisory board. And so we really balance the, the business and the technical side as well as the, the clinical side as well. Any more questions? All right. That was Disease Diagnostic Group. That was, that was one of my favorite products. It's so cool. Thank you so much. Awesome job, John. Okay.